All right. Good afternoon. Good e Good morning, actually. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am not Mike Friedlander, but I am here in his place since he is busy with the advisory committee meeting today. And I am here to introduce, since it's 11 a.m. on Friday morning, we all know what that means. It's the Pioneers in Biomedical Science Research Series at the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute. Um, <clears throat> before I introduce Sora Shin, our colleague, to introduce our speaker today, I want to remind everyone that our next Pioneers in Biomedical Research seminar will be given by Ralph Adolphs um, on November 12th at 11 a.m. That's a Friday. And I also want to remind everyone of the next Maury Strauss Distinguished Public Lecture, which is on a Thursday evening at 5.30, and that will be Mark Batshaw. So I hope you can all join us for that as well. And with that, I will introduce Sora Shin to introduce today's speaker. Sora. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Hi, everyone. It's my honor to introduce today's pioneer speakers. Dr. Fen Wang is professor of brain and cognitive science and investigator at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT. She is a 13 neuroscientist who studies sensory and pain perceptions which is about the way we detect the information from the outside world and how we interpret and process the information at the brain circuit level. She earned her PhD with Richard Axel at Columbia University, where she studied the neural pathway of sense of smell. She did her postdoc research with Mark Tassier Labin at Stanford University, and subsequently, she opened her lab in the Department of Neurobiology at Duke University, where she later was appointed the Morris and Broad Distinguished Professor. In this year, she moved to McGarborn Institute and continued her study about the neural circuit basis of sensory perceptions and sensory motor behaviors. In her recent study, she and her team developed novel technique to label the subset of neurons that become activated in response to external stimulus, and they nicely addressed how the brain creates perception process for the pain management. She published her work in several high-profile journals, and her research has been recognized in numerous awards. She is a recipient of CAC Foundation Award, Brain Research Foundation Scientific Innovation Award, NIH Pioneer Award. She is also elected as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and American Academy of Arts and Science. In 2019, she was invited to provide a special lecture in the Society for Neuroscience, the biggest conference in this field. I also attend this lecture with over a thousand number of audience, and I still remember such a wonderful and fascinating talk she gave at the night. So today we are really looking forward to seeing her recent study. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to her. Dr. Fen, thank you for joining us today. The virtual stage is all yours. Thank you, Sora. That's really over generous introduction. My mother should hear that, so she'll be more proud of me. <laughs> um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I am going to talk to you about uh, two central circuit, central pattern generator and uh, central pain suppression. Uh, so all animals have rhythmic movement. I am showing you a few examples here that you're all very familiar. Uh, so from a really lower vertebrate to us, we have this uh, centrally generated rhythm. So the idea is these uh, repetitive movement, rhythmic movement are generated centrally and without the need for sensory feedback. So that's why it's called a central pattern generator, central rhythm generator, or central oscillator. For simplicity, I'm just gonna call that oscillator. 
okay, because it's oscillating, right? Repeatedly uh, moving. Uh, so this is how my lab dresses and work now, now that we move to the city. <laughs> so how do we know we find uh, the identify the oscillator neurons, right? And what is the mechanism of recent generation? So the idea is we do need a causal manipulation of specific cells that would abolish the rhythm. And preferably we have recordings in vivo to show these cells indeed have this oscillating bursting activity. And in order to understand the mechanism, we would need to understand the connectivity and circuit and probably also cellular properties. So I'm gonna tell you a story on how we study this um, problem. So we use uh, whiskers as our model. Uh, my lab has been studied touch, but uh, very much you can see it's also a self-generated movement, right? So the rodents use their whiskers back and forth to detect uh, uh, ob object in the environment, especially in the dark, because they're not nocturnal animals. And then we want to know where is the central oscillator for whisking, essentially. So uh, several years ago, research by uh, um, Martin Duchenne, David Klenfeld, uh, Jeff Moore, discovered a region in the caudal brainstem or medulla, okay, which they call VERT, ventral intermediate reticular zone, okay, somewhere here. Okay, so near the nucleus ambiguous, so you can see this electrical lesion. When they lesion this region, on the lesion side, you no longer have this high amplitude, high frequency oscillation, which is whisking, right? So whisking seems to be abolished. So they name this, they think this is where the whisking oscillator is. So the question is, what is the molecular and cellular identities, right, of these whisking <coughs> putative vert whisking oscillator neurons, and then uh, do they really have this rhythmic uh, activity in vivo? So a uh, brief overview of what controls whisker movement, okay? So actually whisker movement are controlled by motor neurons in the facial motor nucleus on the lateral side, okay? So the lateral side of facial motor ne neurons project in a twisted way going to the whiskers and then innervate the muscles that generate the movement. So a simple hypothesis is then whisking oscillator neurons are premotor neurons, right? Because motor neurons themselves don't generate the rhythm. So it must be a premotor neuron, presynaptic to motor neurons. And they are the ones that generate the rhythm. So I'm going to tell you a story that uh, really uh, uh, two very talented uh, scientists in my lab uh, that actually uh, discovered the whisk whisking oscillators, neurons, and circuit. So Jean Takado and Vincent uh, Prevosto. So uh, to find the premotor neurons, we uh, have a strategy to study, to map them in the adult nervous system, right? So rabies is the way that usually people use to map presynaptic input. Traditionally, mapping premotor neurons done in neonates just due to technical difficulties. So we're now able to do this in adult. So we first introduce a retrograde CRE in young animals which is efficiently enough to, you know, to retrogradely infect the motor neuron. So these are the, uh, on the lateral side of the facial nerve, these are the motor neuron, you know, with the whiskers. We then complement these motor neurons with rabies complement, and then come in with this uh, uh, pseudotype rabies virus in adult, so we can trace their uh, presynaptic input in adult, okay? So this is, so I'm showing you a representative uh, result from three tracing results, and you can see they are highly stereotyped. So these are the whisker premotor neurons. Sure enough, in the region we call vert, there are premotor neurons. Okay, and then make a long story short, we test a lot of candidate markers, and it turns out half of them express parvalbumin. All right. So we wonder whether or not the parvabumi expressing virgin premotor neurons are then the oscillator cells. 
Now, poverty means everywhere, and uh, almost half of the cortical neuroscientists use this poverty in Cree to study fast backing interneurons. So, to specifically label the poverty mean premotor neurons for the whisker motor neurons, we developed a genetic viral intersectional strategy. So, we have this is called a split Cree. Okay, so you can split Cree into two halves. One half, the Cree N half, is knocked into the pavabimin locus. So neuron express pavabimin will express half of the Cree. The other half of the Cree can be injected into the motor nucleus using a retrograde virus. This retrograde virus then bring the other half of the Cree to all the premotor neurons. And then so the full Cree is only reconstituted in the pavabumin premotor neuron that project to the motor neurons, right? And then if we inject a Cree-dependent AAV in this region, then we would then specific label and manipulate this neuron. So this is shown here. So we have a retrograde lentivirus bringing in half of the Cree, and then in this Cree and mouse, and this intersectional strategy allow us to label, specifically label, the neurons express power we mean projecting to uh, the facial motor. So we call them vert neurons. And here showing as an in-situ hybridization of these uh, vert premotor neurons, uh, parabium expressing, it turns out almost all of them expressing glycine T2 or VGAD, so they all inhibitory neurons. Keep that in mind for now. Okay, so very quickly, now these are called vert PV neurons, premotor neurons, okay? So using the same strategy, gene express tetanus toxin in these cells. There's about 200 of these cells in the mouse brain. So when he si using tetanus toxin to silence the output of these neurons, this is a silent site, this is control site, and you see the control site still whiskers, and the silent side has no whisker, right? And then the whisker is in a very much pro more protracted location. So this is summarized here. You see the nice uh, whisking oscillation, and then this is the traces, and then very minimal movement, but in a more protracted location. So you uh, amplitude reduced, set point protracted oscillation is gone. Okay. So yes, these are indeed critical for whisking generation. So that is the general model fits with all previous literature that whisking is generated by a tonic excitatory input that protract the motor neurons uh, together with rhythmic inhibition. So then you have the cycles, right? You protract and inhibit, protract, inhibit. So then are really these vert PV printer rhythmic? We don't know, right? And then also, um, do they fire in the retraction phase? But right? if they are the oscillator, they have to be rhythmic and they have to fire in the retraction phase so that whisker can retract. So to, to answer these two questions, you really need in vivo recording. In vivo recording in brainstem is pain in the, you know what, right? So. We use uh, something called photo tagging, uh, thanks to the development of optogenetics. We can express channel adoption using the same intersectional strategy, expressing channel adoption in these neurons, and then do recordings while mouse is running on the wheel. Okay. Um, it sounds easy, but it turns out to be really difficult. So it took Vincent four years and many mice. Eventually he recorded seven phototactic neurons from six mice. So why is it so hard? Uh, it's incredibly hard. I mean, you haven't seen in vivo phototactic recording from uh, caudal brainstem. The brainstem moves a lot. So when electrodes come down, cause a lot of lesions. So it's really hard. Usually you put electrodes down, you lesion the neurons. And then if you have a opt opt optic fiber also coming down, you kill the vert, right? So in the end, Vincent have to put the optic fiber in the facial nucleus to excite these neurons up to genetically and you record an antidromic spike to identify these neurons. Long story short, uh, this is when Vincent gave the uh, blue uh, laser pulse and you can see you elicit the spikes, right? Boom, boom. So this is the photo technique. Huh? And remarkably, so I'm showing you a uh, recording and you can hear, right? So this is as the mouse is whisking and this is the photo tag unit and, and you can see. 
you can hear the birds, right? And then all the birds, when you uh, cloud them, they're all actually in the retraction phase. Okay, so that's nice, right? So we, Vincent actually recorded many neurons. Okay, so now six phototype, I should update my, uh, <laughs> my slides. So all the phototype neurons are fire bursting in this retraction phase, along with many unphototype, just blind recorded neurons that, in, you know, when he's trying to work out strategy, he recorded a lot of blind and recorded neurons. So largely they're separated into two groups. You have the retract protraction unit. So this is protraction and this is retraction. So the neurons tend to fire at the end of the protraction traction and the beginning of the retraction. And remember their inhibitory neuron, right? So their fire would then drive the inhibition and then allow the whisker to retract. So it's, uh, it's very satisfying to see this. Now, the ability to record neurons in vivo with identity right, would allow us then to ask what happens before whisking, right? Mouse don't whisk all the time. And in the field of locomotion, right, you, you, you learn all of these uh, in spinal cord uh, and this um, rhythmic bursting. It's always in the in vitro prep. You add a ton of neurotransmitters and then you see the bursting. And you don't really know what happens before that, right? In vivo, I had assumed the neurons would just be quiet and then switch on to this uh, bursting mode. But it turns out I was wrong. So you see all of, so I'm showing you two examples of two retraction unit and a protraction unit, right? So the protraction unit bursts in the protraction phase, whereas the retraction unit bursts in the retraction phase. They were all tonically active, okay? Rhythm is generated when the brain decides I want to whisk. So this immediately suggests and then this is just showing you a, 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 a power spectrum and you can see frequency emerges only upon whiskey, right? Uh, so initially you actually see a burst of excitation. So they start to fire more and then suddenly rhythm appears. So this suggests rhythm generation is now the intrinsic property of these vert PV neurons, okay? It's a network property. So how do we find the network property? Um, so the first thing is we map the input to these uh, word PV neurons using the same intersectional strategy with rabies complement. So we, these are the starter cells and we let them jump to show us where the inputs are and the inputs are obviously in many parts of the brain schematically summarized here, okay? So and compared to the more premotor neurons, the premotor neurons, and then the pre premotor neurons. Right? So these are pre vert neurons. They have different distributions, but within the pre vert neurons, they look quite similar. Okay, so these are just spatial correlation plots. This you can see where they are. So there's actually a lot of local input within vert. Okay, so we label a lot of cells locally. So this led us to wanted to know whether or not vert vert neurons can connect with each other. <clears throat> so Jun did is with uh, expressing membrane GFP and synapse and Ruby in the vert PV cells. And so indeed, in addition to see their projection to the lateral side of the motor neuroclea, facial motor, which is the motor neuron is, you see a lot of synaptic button locally. Okay, just very extensive locally. And then they, the green cells are the, the, the cells, are the, the word PV cells. And then you can see putangs onto each other. So the neurons do connect with each other, right? And then Jun further characterized the, uh, the, the connections. So what he did is after rabies tracing to label the pre-vert neurons. So these are the green cells are presynaptic input to the vert cells, the source cells. And then if you look at these neurons, okay, all of them are VGAT positive, meaning all of them are inhibitory. And then 65% are PV positive, which is our vert PV neurons, meaning they connect with each other. Then there's a group that is PV negative, which is a group of inhibitor now, which we think may be the protraction neurons that inhibit the retraction neurons. Then the retraction neurons form a recurrent auto inhibition. OK, 
Okay. So this immediately made us uh, sort of remind us of this. Um, oh, I'm, I'm just putting a, sorry. I, uh, this is the summary. These are the uh, inhibitory input locally, and you have uh, excitatory input from top-down regions as well as um, a mixed input from other regions. Okay, and then these neurons send a retraction signal, uh, inhibitory signal to the to the uh, motor neuron. So this mutual inhibition reminds us of what people have been studying in the field, right, of oscillators, mutual inhibition. I'm showing you one example in cortical fast spiking interneurons, right? Now, if the connection is really strong. If neuron one fires, neuron two will never fire, right? Because it will be always inhibited. But if the connection is weak, okay, the key is it's weakly reciprocal connection. So when this inhibition is dampens, and if they're also receiving excitatory input, then neuron two will fire and then can inhibit neuron one, right? And depends on connectivity strength and firing frequency, you know, at 45 hertz and Barry Connors showed, they fire antiphase, you know, one, two, one, two. But at 85 hertz in the cortical fast spike interneuron, they can synchronize. So they both fire, then shut down each other, then fire again, shut down each other, right? So what we think is maybe our vert network, the recurrent network, is what this is recurring condition, allow them to burst together and shut down each other. So to test that, we need a strategy to block inhibitory synaptic input to vert PV neuron. It's not a perfect strategy, but it's the best we can come up with. So uh, Don Arnold developed this GFE3 molecule. It's gaffrin finger e ubiquitin ligase. So essentially it recognized gaffrin and then degraded. it. And gaffrin is the key scaffolding protein for the inhibitory synapse, right? So this way, this GFE3 would allow us to abolish inhibitory synaptic input in vertical neurons. Okay, so this is showing you histology that though the puncta on the infected neuron, the gaffrin puncta drastically reduced. So it dampens the inhibitory input to the vert neurons. And what happens to these mice? Right? It's really interesting. So this is control side, and you can see beautiful whisking oscillation. Now, when you block this recurrent inhibition, you get irregular whisking, much smaller amplitude, a lot of these little jittery things. And then if you only focus on the larger uh, whiskings, they seem to be more coincide with breathing. So gray trays are breathing, okay? Green is the uh, block inhibition side and then black is controls. So what happens is you, you lost the high frequency whisking, then the remaining whisking-like movement is pretty much driven by breathing. So, uh, I won't go into these quantification. You can look at it. So the idea is usually all oral facial movements sort of are connected with breathing, and so it's kind of known that breathing is the master clock. And then you have other higher frequencies generated by other oscillators. Okay, so uh, so so this is how we think whisking works. At rest. Um, these neurons are only have tonic activity. These tonic activity because it's not rhythmic, and so therefore it's not strong enough to have a coherent rhythmic output. And then there's not much, you know, um, excitatory input to start the uh, whisking come on. And you can see the whisker pad gently oscillates, and that's from the breathing output. In the normal whisking, the excitation comes down, excites this recurrent network, and then kick it into a mode of bursting, rhythmic bursting. That then generate rhythmic output in the retraction phase. And then the excitation plus rhythmic inhibition allow whisking to happen. And you still have the uh, breathing modulation on top of that. When we're using tetanus toxin to block the output, all you have is a tonal excitation, therefore the whisker is protracted. When we use GFE3 to block this recurrent inhibition, they hypothesize we don't have in vivo data. Unfortunately, we're still trying. 
that they become a, a, a eurythmic, so asynchronous firing, but it's stronger because they receive a citatory input. So you, so then you have a re increased asynchronous output inhibition, thereby you have reduced amplitude, you have irregular whisking, then the remaining whisking is only driven uh, by the, the breathing oscillator. So that's how we think it works. Okay, now I'm gonna switch gears to talk about the central control of pain. And I'm trying to, in the end, bring them together. Everything I think is centrally generated in the end. Uh, so you would think very much pain is driven by bottom up, right? You have a pain sensation then goes to the brain, your voila, I feel pain. However, uh, you know, the famous case of phantom pain, right? This limb is no longer there, it's amputated but patients can still pain, feel pain in this phantom limb. So that suggests your nervous system have a way to create the pain without the actual peripheral input. So there are other examples of central control of pain. One of them is soldiers on battlefield and they are sort of in, in a strong emotional state and usually they actually feel much less pain. Uh, in the World War II, the surgeon Beach re uh, recognized that surgery can be done without anesthetics because the soldiers just simply don't feel pain. And then the other centrally generated pain control is placebo effect. So if you believe you're getting the painkiller, you actually can feel uh, better. So we're really interested in finding the central node to control pain. Uh, the idea is that, you know, because the bottom up goes to all over the brain. And if you want to treat chronic pain, you have to inhibit all of these parts, then it's really hard. If there's a central knob that we can control it, then it's much easier to control pain, right? So we turn to general anesthesia. So one of the main function of general anesthesia is analgesia or anti-nociception, anti-pain, such that surgery is humane, right? And it turns out uh, there's a long history of intraoperative awareness. <clears throat> so you would think that loss of consciousness, of course, loss of pain, sorry. <clears throat> But it turns out you can wake up during surgery, but you're still paralyzed because you have the muscle relaxing. Uh, but you're aware of surgeon's conversation. You even have tactile sensation. They're operating on you, but you don't have pain. So this suggests you can have awareness without pain. So this is what motivated us to look for uh, where in the brain, maybe there is something that anesthetics work on so that turn off pain perception. Uh, it turns out low dose channel anesthetics are really uh, used at, actually as a analgesic. So I'm showing here dexmedetomidin. When you give low dose, patients are aware, no loss of consciousness, but their pain score is drastically reduced. And ketamine actually is used to give to a terminal cancer patient, or actually uh, a lot of chronic uh, regional pain syndrome patients, when opioids no longer working, ketamine still works. So when they get ketamine, the intensity of pain is drastically reduced without loss of consciousness. So this then promoted us to test a hypothesis that general anesthesia activate a central circuit to suppress pain. And this was done by uh, two very talented people in my lab, Tui Hua and uh, Bing Chen. <clears throat> so indeed in mouse, when we give them isofluorine, we find a region, okay? So we look, we will look for the activated region rather than, because the whole brain is pretty much shut down. It's pretty quiet, but central amygdala lights up with c files expression, boom. c files is activity mark. And this is where central amygdala is. And ketamine does the same thing. Also lights up central amygdala, even though the rest of the brain become quite quiet. Okay, so we call these cells CEAGA for general anesthesia activated CEA neurons. <coughs> uh, turns out all of them are GABAergic, okay? 
so one can cross to a GABA GFP uh, line. So they're all inhibitory neurons. Amygdala has been known as a center for processing emotion and the pain. In fact, there is a direct pain projection from peribrachial region, which received nociceptive input to the amygdala, central amygdala. So it's really perplexing that in a sort of pro-nociceptive emotional pain region that we have anesthetic activated neurons. Uh, so what molecule, you know, what are the molecular markers? So we tested a bunch of them that are known to express in CEA. And I'm showing you, so here, red is FAUS, is CEAGA, okay, and it said activate neurons. Pink one, pre encephalin is blue, and PKC delta is in green. So you have blue only and green only cells, but you also have, you know, all sorts of combinations. Suffice to say, a lot of our NCAGA neurons express PKC delta, but not all PKC delta are CAGA neurons, and subsets of them also express prepro encephalin. So here is just a summary. Because we don't have a perfect marker that only label the subsets of, let's say, PKC delta neurons, we turn to our activity dependent method that my lab developed, which we call CAN, capturing activate neuronal ensembles. So, in this method, neurons that are expressing FAUS also express transiently a destabilized receptor, TVA, okay, DSTVA co-expressed with FAUS. So in the time window of TVA FAUS expression, we can use a virus that recognizes TVA receptor envelope, and we engineer to be a weak interaction so we don't uh, capture the background FAUS expressing neurons that then can in recognize the receptor and infect the FAUS positive neurons leading to expression of gene of interest. Okay, so we usually inject a cane Cre and then together with Cre dependent AAV to express gene of interest in this region. So here, particularly, we put mouse down with isofluorine, then we inject things we want to inject, <laughs> uh, express gene of interest in the CAGA neurons. So shown here are GFP that label CAGA neurons. And then if we re-expose them with isofluorine to reinduce FAUS, you can see a beautiful overlap, right? So this is efficient and specific. And then we can capture them with cane, with isofluorine, and re-expose them with ketamine or dexmedotomidin. And you can see the, the capture cells are also reactivated by ketamine and dexmedotomidin, although isofluorine really is the most potent one to induce false expression. Okay, now that we can manipulate and label these neurons, but the first thing we did is to measure their activity profile. So we express GCAMP using the cane method in CEAGA neurons. As you will see, the mouse it, we, will, is, is moving in the chamber and you actually see spontaneous activity of these cells. Now, when isofluorine is on, right, you can see here, boom, right, a boom, an uh, increase of activity. And this increased activity continues as the animals are in the chamber and eventually the animal will go down to anesthesia, right? You can see that, but the last hurrah, then the tail collapsed, but the neurons continue to fire. Okay, where's that? So this is profile here, and you can see actually only a subset of neurons showing this robust continued firing during continued anesthesia. A lot of them have this transient profile. We actually don't have molecular markers to distinguish the continuous versus transient fire neurons, but suffice to say, yes, some of them indeed have continued firing under anesthesia. Okay, and the same neurons, so these are the neurons identified. If we, so I just showed you the response to isofluorine. If we then let the mouse wake up the next day, give the mouse ketamine, you can see they also have ketamine activated activity. Indeed, this is a shared ensemble of anesthesia activated neurons. So what might be the role, right? 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a set of experiments. Uh, so here we express channel or thousand. We usually express unilaterally or bilaterally. Bilateral is a stronger effect. Unilateral has an effect already. And then uh, I'm color coding my uh, up to genetic experiment, blue would be channel adoption activating them, pink would be RQ adoption to inhibit these cells, and GFP would be used as controls. And so what we're going to show you are uh, initially, I ask uh, my student to put in, just see what happens in the, in the chamber, open chamber, okay? Uh, this is a channel adoption mice. We want to know whether there's any fear or loss of consciousness because amygdala is involved in fear, right? And then when laser is on, activating these neurons, nothing happened, okay? So my student Tui was so disappointed coming back telling me nothing happened, project ends, forget it. And I was like, great, this is exactly what I wanted. Uh, and she actually really wanted to be fear or consciousness. She did all these, uh, you know, fear essays, whatever, elevated plasma, it's nothing, no snow effect. And I said, I was hoping that they may actually affect pain behavior. Why don't you do a set of pain tests? So what she did is then a set of experiment. I'm going to show you, show you some examples of that, which is dry ice, cold, essay, heat, uh, I say uh, elect sort of electronic van fray and face van fray. These are mechanical pain, I say. And then also we will give the mouse formally injection to in elicit pain, either in the paw, in the face, and then finally she will do histology to confirm the expression. Okay, so the, in the dry eyes, I say it's through the pexy glass, so it's not really cold, but when they feel cold, they should move away. Now, normal mice, uh, the injective is channel adoption baseline, no lights on. You can see you put the dry ice bar there. Uh, they will, they tend to move away. It's not a very robust behavior. But if you look at the channel adoption, this is channel adoption on stimulating the CEAGA neurons, really not moving away, not feeling the the part is cooling down, right? And this one, this one, the mouse even started grooming. Really didn't recognize that the paw is being. Uh, feeling really cold. And then same thing is for heat, right? So we have a beam that stimulates the pole. And then when it's heating up, the pole will move away and you can see, right? That's the end of the trial. But if we turn the channel adoption on to activate CEAGA neurons, and what you can see is we can really heat it up for a long time. Uh, and then it's really very minimum response. Okay, you can see that eventually uh, they will respond. So in all these reflexive pain assays, channel adoption will make them less painful or delay the response, whereas RQ adoption <coughs> would uh, shorten the response reaction time to make them more sensitive. Okay, and I'm going to show you an RQ adoption response, right? So this, I'm gonna show you a bound free, a, a, a poke, like a little, little blunted needle poking at the face. And then uh, I'm going to show you what happens when we uh, silence these neurons. So what you can see is we're using a 0.04 gram, which is very mild. Normally uh, they don't respond. So. The, the test is one free response. Okay, so laser off, no silencing. We poke with 0.04 gram, no response because this is below their detection threshold. Okay, let's just uh, slow down the version. And then we're going to learn laser on now. Okay, silence is EAG. You can see response now to the previously undetectable uh, filament, now the mouse is trying to get rid of it. And that's a typical response of response to pain for stimuli. Okay. Right, yeah. So again, we can have this bi-directional regulation that when they are um, silenced, they respond. The silence these CAG neurons mouse responded with hypersensitivity. When we activate these neurons, they respond much less. So compared to GFP controls, by one gram, they do respond. So, so there's a limit of 
you know, if it really is strong stimulus, the mouse will respond. Okay. So what about uh, self recuperate So those are the reflexive behavior. Now I'm going to talk to you about recuperative behavior. So if you inject in the paw with formalin, they will lick it. Inject in the face, they will groom it. And then what happens when we turn the CEAGA neuron on, right? So this is a channel adoption, laser out. It's licking the inflamed paw like mad. Okay. And then lights will come on. Boom instantaneously stop licking the mouse who's just walking around. Why am I licking my paw? Nothing wrong with it, right? So it's super robust effect. And same thing for uh, face. Uh, so it's rubbing the inflamed face uh, like mad because we just inject formally and no lights on. So now uh, you see in a second, so see they're really trying to rubbing the face. Lights on, instantaneously stop wiping the face, right? Just simply walk around, no problem. So this is almost like a magic switch that suddenly switch off this bad sensation uh, of all these uh, painful stimuli. So we're pretty happy. And you can see every time we, uh, this is GFP control, gradually they do stop wiping, okay? GFP control with the lights on because the, the formalin wears off. Now, if we do channel adoption, every time we turn the lights on, they, they just completely stop wiping their face. And then if we do RQ adoption, even in the later phase when they shouldn't be wiping, they still have increased uh, wiping. So it's more sensitized. Again, there's this di bi-directional regulation activating CHA, inhibiting pain we are silencing them, uh, sort of a sensitized mouse. So what happened to a chronic pain model, right? In a chronic pain model, we ligate this nerve, so the mouse becomes hypersensitive to anything touch on their face. So I'm going to show you, here we are going to use a one gram, okay? Remember one gram, even in control mouse, CAG has no effect because it's so strong, it's like a needle poking, they will respond. And then you, this is GFP control with one gram, after sensitization, they absolutely hate it. It's a hundred percent wiping response. They even use both paws to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when we activate CAGA? Stimulation off, hate it, right? Wipe it, one gram, absolutely hate it. Now, this is slow down. You can see the grimace as well as the paw reaction. When we turn the stimulus on, activating CAGA. Absolutely no response. The mouse is completely chill, okay? And didn't even detect this previously, even on the control side, they would have detected, right? So it's not only sensitivity is gone, but we also re revealed a high pole sensitivity. It makes sense because we ligated this nerve. So there's actually less information coming in. So all the hypersensitivity actually is generated somewhere in the central nervous system. And then the CEAGA activation can shut down this hypersensitivity. So we still need to, to try to figure that out. All right, it's really potent. So I'm not gonna read the summary. So where do these neurons project to? They project to way too many places for us to make sense now. And we're still trying to figure out what to do with all these targets. Uh, a lot of them are involved in processing uh, anxiety like PNSD. Insular is sort of a processing this homeostatic set point pain. Uh, a lot of in the, in the associate region, subthalamic region, peripheral region, you know, TAG, you name it. So a lot a lot of them are known to processing emotional response of pain, but what's missing is sensory cortex. There's no projection to somatosensory cortex. Uh, the other thing we did, which is fun, is if we inject formalin, we will induce false expression in all these pain regions, right? But if we inject formalin and give a one second on, or actually three second on, three second off CHEA stimulation, all of these regions that are activated by pain signal, the false expression reduced, which is quantified here. Remember CAGA is inhibitory, right? They have this widespread projection. So it makes sense when they're activated, they shut down the activation across many, many regions. So it really looks like a gate for uh, pain perception. 
And the um, final thing is, remember when we say low dose energy and, and uh, anesthetics is a pain suppressor, can we use CAGA? You know, if we silence them, maybe this uh, uh, drug induced analgesia is abolished, right? So uh, indeed, uh, even at low dose, so this is a low isoflurane, low ketamine, these neurons are activated. In fact, at low dose isoflurane, they are activated better than at high dose. Okay, so what we did is in jack mouse with capsaicin, then they will lick their paw because capsaicin is painful. And then we will inject either uh, ketamine or which is analgesic, or ketamine with a uh, arcuatopsin mediated inhibition of CAGA neurons, right? When you inject ketamine together with capsaicin, they leak much less because ketamine is analgesic. But if you inject ketamine together with silencing these CAGA neurons, they leak just as much, suggesting really you need these neurons for uh, analgesic induced uh, pain suppression, right? To close the whole loop. So, Basically, what I've told you is uh, this is the sort of a uh, almost complete, not complete, completely complete <laughs> pain circuit. Uh, that in the center of the emotional part of the pain circuit, we have identified the CAGA neurons. And it has widespread projection to this part by sparing the sensory thalamus and sensory cortex. So you, it's not losing of sensation, but losing the negative effect associated with the sensation. I think that's the key. So they abolish this negative effect. Uh, so we're really interested in now whether there are other drugs that not, you know, if we can find other drugs or other uh, small molecules to activate these cells, they will be really potent painkillers, right? Uh, we are doing a lot of RNA uh, sequencing. So far, I haven't found a smoking gun that tell me why they're activated by anesthetics yet. I'm still continuing to search. But uh, let's say I find um, a small molecule that seems to be specifically activate these neurons, right? Then you, um, you wonder whether or not this long-term using of any painkiller would again be addictive, right? Even though we say, okay, this is maybe the non-addictive, non-opioid pathway. What if, you know, it, should you find a chemical or some ways, then it becomes addiction. Mind has a way to find addiction anyway. So in thinking along this line, we were thinking about, can we take advantage of the placebo effect? So such that we can reverse engineer a placebo effect. By reverse engineering, I mean, if we trick, if we associate something with CAG activation, then later on, just that context alone would activate CAG to reduce pain. Wouldn't that be wonderful, right? So can we pair activation of CAGA neurons induced pain relief with a context in animal study such that context alone later after the associative learning can relieve pain, right? So we use a pain model that give you a chronic pain. So this is Paclitaxel, which is chemotherapy drug used for cancer, treating cancer. And this induces a longer lasting, long lasting pain, neuropathic pain, which is, you know, it's a mouthful, chemotherapy induced neuro, neuropathy, CIP. Okay. So we use this model and we inject uh, this drug a few times and then mouse become really sensitized uh, to mechanical stimuli. And then we can test that in sort of a regular context. Then we're going to put them into a pain relief contact. In this contact, they will get a laser activation of CAG neurons, optogenetic activation, with um, you know on and off, on and off for thirty minutes. Okay. Then after conditioning for three days, every day thirty minutes, then we're gonna test their pain responses, either in the regular context of my my PowerPoint itself, or in the pain relief context, and see their pain response. Okay. So after uh, uh, this um, drug injection, you can see 
they are they already respond to this low level. So the pole is actually less sensitive. Usually at 0.16 gram, they rarely respond. But because it's, they're sensitized, they respond a lot. And then they certainly respond with withdrawal at a higher, higher force, right? Now, in the pain relief box, where they previously got pain relief, their response are all lower. And then this is as good as giving in the regular box with channel adoption stimulation of CAGA, right? So this is quantified here. You can see contacts alone now have this analgesic effect. So this is what we call it's great, and we're still trying to figure out how much conditioning we needed, how long this effect would last. But really, the goal is: should we find a magic stimulation or drug? We were trying to pair that out. Let's say with an iPhone, iPad app, and then next time you just need to put on your <laughs> earphone, look at the map app, then you can get your uh, release. So we we're hoping this is our dream. Okay, so I've told you two pathways, centrally generated movement and centrally controlled pain sensation. So where my lab is going on really is to understand from the brain's perspective, how centrally generated expectations and then sort of um, um, internally generated predictions would then affect your uh, sensory perception. So here is this famous uh, rubber hand illusion, right? So this is a PhD student. Uh, this is this fake rubber hand. This is his real arm. And the other PhD student is synchronously brushing the rubber hand and then the real arm. And then pretty soon, he would think this rubber hand is his own. And you can see, okay, this rubbing, rubbing, Boom, he's retracting his own hand, right? He thought this is jabbing his own hand. So, so quickly, very much you have that. And so you, you needed to think maybe all the sensations we sense have this top-down control that we wanted to understand that. And that's what, uh, now that we move to MIT, it would be a central focus of uh, what, um, my lab is. So this is my lab. This is all my founding source. I have uh, said uh, their names. So uh, Jean and Vincent is for the central pattern generator. Bing is working on the pain. Tui has graduated, is now uh, making lots of money in a company. <laughs> so, and uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. I really like this fake applause. <laughs> it's very rewarding. <laughs> That's really fascinating talk, and and uh, it's awesome data. And I'm really surprised that some uh, some general anesthetic effect they make some very common feature in the neural some activity. So they have some somewhat different some molecular target, right? So ketamines and or some GABA receptor or some yeah. glucose receptor. So, uh, do you have have in mind any some molecular targets and uh, some commonly underlying that uh, some phenomenon? I know we were hoping now that we move to MIT, we can sequence the hell out of this neuron trying to figure out, right? So far, I haven't seen a uh, smoking gun. <laughs> I don't know yet, but we did some. Uh, also, yeah, this they are also activated by propofol. This is propofol and CAGA. So we, what we did is, let me show you uh, some experiment. So uh, where am I? They have... Uh, very much, uh, they have a little bit elevated internal chloride. So if we patch onto the CEA gene around, right? Um, and, you know, GFE positive versus neighboring GFE negative controls. And we, we measure their reversal, chloride reversal potential. So all of the neurons have a slightly, you know, elevated reversal potential. So make them maybe, Remember all the anesthetics somehow potentiate GABA, right? Maybe because they are slightly elevated, then they tend to reverse. But this is not a major difference. So I don't quite understand uh, what, why, whether or not this plays a major role. The other surprising finding is that when we add uh, ketamine, because ketamine is an NMD antagonist mm -hmm. that rapidly changes the reversal potential, make them even more easier to reverse. Uh, so we're still trying to figure that out. Mm 
yeah, it would be really interesting to, to, to know what happens. Yeah. And there are a number of questions in the chat box. And Anthony asks, does the uh, rhythmic rhythmicity of the BERT inhibitory neurons indicate that uh, retraction is passive and not actively regulated by the fascia and motor neurons? So what we think is a tonic protraction and you need an active inhibition, right? So, so that, that is the re relaxation, allowed to relax. What I didn't say is there's a separate group of motor neurons that innervate the entire whisker pad. So you can then retract the entire pad. They don't innervate individual whiskers. So what I showed you really, yes, I agree with you. It may now be the more active retraction because you just relax, right? So more normally mouse, whisking, relax, whisking, relax. But when they need to actively retract, you engage a separate group of motor neurons, which are the active pad, whole pad retraction motor neuron that can further retract. So good question, yeah. I didn't talk about that other group. And he also asked, uh, does cortical control of a whisking uh, impact BERT or fascia nucleus directly? So uh, there's almost no direct connection from motor cortex to the facial motor neurons. There are a few cortical neurons in our transsynaptic tracing that we label that project to the vert region, the rhizmogenesis. But what happens also we see is a lot of input from which I didn't, I, I think I just glossed over in superior colliculus and red nucleus and cerebellum deep nucleus. So the superior colliculus receive cortical input. So maybe it's an indirect pathway from cortex to superior colliculus to um, the vert region. I also had uh, some similar question with us. So for the some, maybe I'm missing that part. For the some central amygdala, some GABA neurons, when you look at the connections, the tracing study, have you ever looked at any some dermatosensory uh, cortex or some sensory thalamus is connected uh, to the some central amygdala? Yeah, so being did the uh, transsynaptic tracing, I decided not to show it, but I can show it. So here, so we did a, rabies tracing. So these are the input. Really, most of the input is from associative cortex on the lateral side. So, uh, uh, and, then, and then it does receive input from periventricular uh, thalamus. So the, the middle part of the thalamus. So PVT, periventricular thalamus, indeed receive direct pain input, right? So there is a pathway either directly from actually dorsal horn or indirectly through uh, uh, some neurons in the, in the periphericial region. So yes, but the vast majority input are hippocampus and the side, the side the, the association cortex. So right. uh, indeed there is a thalamic input. And uh, also uh, Albert uh, asked, the effect of manipulating central uh, amygdala governance neuron activity on pain sensation is so striking. So yeah, have you uh, looked at uh, the activity of peripheral sensory neurons or spinal cord ocean horn? Are they also affected or is the effect entirely central? Yeah, so um, when we did, the on and off, uh, when we did the formal simulation, right, we mapped the entire brain with false expression. Then we did a CEA, and I showed you all these central regions of false reduce, right? What I should have showed you is the uh, SPC, the spinal cordalis, where we inject the formula into the face, right? So that's the second order neuron, and their false remain. So we didn't affect the sensory neuron and their first synapse. We we affect the rest of the brain. So good question, yeah. And, and Sujana also asked, what is the frequency of stimulation needed in the central amygdala governor's neurons to reduce the pain? So we did, uh, there's not much difference between 10 hertz and 20 hertz. That's our uh, stimulation frequency. Uh, we haven't uh, tried the, you know, maybe a step function. Right, so I think it would be nice. And, and from a therapeutic perspective, what we really should try is dress and also try the step function, SSFO, right? That sort of elevated threshold and lasts for 30 minutes. And I haven't tried that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's a good, good point. Yeah. And also, Anthony wondered that uh, is the effect of stopping leaking, grooming, uh, localized mapped response, or uh, a state response where they are aware, unaware of any painful stimulus? Ah, good question. Is it really loss of pain or just loss of um, movement, right? They decided I don't care. I wish I, I, wish I can answer that question. <laughs> so uh, what I am doing now is in addition to measure these just motor output, right? So pain very much elicits robust autonomic response, which hasn't been done in the past, you know, decade that to measure the auto simultaneous measure autonomic response. And if that is more telling, because you really can control your autonomic response, right? But you can control your motor output. So I wanted to know whether or not activating the CAGA also dampens the autonomic response that may be also more a visceral sign of pain that may sort of further support that they are anti-pain rather than anti-movement or changing movement we're not knowing where the body part is. So they get lost. Yes, very good point. Yeah, actually there are uh, still, there are a number of questions, but uh, with time being, I think we need to stop here. So uh, thanks everyone. And thanks uh, Dr. Fen Wang for a wonderful talk uh, today. Uh, yeah, it was really fascinating. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to meet with uh, faculties and the students. So in yeah. half an hour, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. And thank you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See you guys later.